I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman, Chairman of the Greensboro Fire Department History Group Committee. The American Fire Service is rich in tradition and culture. A firefighter's life is filled with many emotional highs and lows. Stories of major fires, national disasters, medical calls, firehouse living, and family life are often verbally shared from one generation to another. Many times these stories are lost forever when a firefighter passes away. In an effort to preserve these stories, in 2019, the Greensboro Fire Department History Book Committee launched a new program of recording audio video of our retirees' lives. These stories will be shared on our website, gfhbc.org. In 2020, we did not record because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please listen as these firefighters share their life experiences with all of us. I'm uh, Richard Page. I joined the uh, fire department. Uh, actually, I was working for the city. I was working at City Hall for seven months before uh, I came to the fire department. And uh, I uh, had put in an application when I was working at Western Electric. And a friend of mine was working at City Hall. And when I was working up there, I, my first job would at the city was to collect the money from the parking meters. And this friend of mine who got me the job, I found out later that he and Buck Boucher, Chief Boucher, were good friends. And I had put this guy down as a reference. Well, he came to me one day after I had moved inside working. Asked me if I still wanted to be on the fire department. I said, oh yeah. He said, well, Chief Boucher called me and said they will start a new class in May 1958 and if I was interested to give him a call so I called him and that's how I got on the department okay. so I was there from 1958 May the 15th I retired June the 1st 1989 well I grew I was born and raised in Reedsville and the way I got to Greensboro is uh, my wife was from Greensboro and she was in school at uh, WC then. It's now uh, Greensboro, what is it? College. UNC yeah. Greensboro. Anyway, so she's in school. So I moved over here so she could con continue her education. I'm not related to any present fireman that I know of. Now, Randall Simpson was married to my wife's niece when I came on, and I asked the chief if that would be a problem, because I knew some companies didn't like the uh, relatives working together, but I came to come to find out that there were several brothers working on the department at that time. One of the reasons that I decided to come on the fire department was uh, several of the Several of my friends at church had just joined. Randall Simpson had just joined. J.W. Manus had just come on the department. They were talking about how much they liked it. And at that time, I was working at Western Electric. So I thought, well, I'll just go down and put my application in. So I did. But you know, just a few years ago, I got to thinking. Back when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I went to a theater in Reedsville to see a movie, and I don't remember what the movie was, but they had a short subject on Chicago Fire Department. And I think the, the subject was the uh, that schoolhouse at Byrne, which would have been in the late 30s, early 40s maybe. And I remember after that went off, I thought, I'd like to do that. <laughs> so I don't know if that came to my mind before that or not, but I just was thinking about that a few years ago. The best, my starting salary, the best I can remember was $242 a month. We were in training for one month, four weeks. Some of the people in my training class were, uh, well, Larry Bradley was one, uh, Bob Parrish, we were real good friends, uh, Harold Smith, uh, 
Les Ray, uh, Donnie Varner, uh, Tiny Wagner, uh, John, know, John Shepard, well, John R. Shepard, John Robert Shepard, uh, Jim, uh, or Dave, we called him David. Who was his last name? Sharp. He was in our class. There was a few. There were a few people in our class who had already been on the department, and so they knew some of the stuff that we didn't know. <laughs> being rookies, and that's, but they hadn't been to training, so they were going to training with us. Well, Les Ray. Well, during training, there were a lot of uh, uh, interesting times. Uh, Les Ray and Harold Smith. They were always into something else. Something. Mischievous, I would say. But I think the most trying thing for me was jumping into that net. I, the first time I jumped in that thing, I hit on my feet. And when I got off that net, I could hardly walk. My back was hurting so, but I was not about to tell anybody that it was hurting. Because I knew they would probably ship me out of there. But the one thing I did like was sliding that rope repelling down the side of the building. Well, and the palm pier was a, a single rail, I guess you'd call it, and it had uh, rungs that stuck out on each side of it and it had a big old hook on the top end that you would raise it up and stick that hook in the window and it had little notches would catch. And you climbed up the side of that building on that thing and a lot of people, they did not like it. I remember this one guy. Once we climbed up, then we would go inside and we would stand there and sort of uh, keep that hook in place so it wouldn't slide out. Of course, I don't think it was going to slide out that one anyway. But this one guy, he came up, man. He was hugging that thing and sweating like a pig when he got to the top. He was a big old guy. I was ex-Marine at that. But he didn't like that thing. When we were in training, we became very close together. We uh, we joked together, we worked together, we helped each other out. And if somebody was about to do something wrong, somebody else would come and help them out. They didn't let them go on and make a mistake if they could help it. My first station assignment actually was at Station 1 or Central Station. But we got out of training uh, June 15th, let's see, we were in our month. But we spent a lot of time cleaning up Station 9 because it had not been opened yet. Uh, 10 had opened and 7 had opened. Those three were built at the same time. Uh, so anyway, we spent a lot of time out there cleaning up. But then uh, after we finished all that. We spent a lot of time at Central Station until we were actually assigned to a company. So we would go in at 8 o'clock and work to 5 o'clock until I think it was the 1st of uh, July when we were actually assigned to a company. And I was on the head old tanker at Station 1 and I was assigned to it along with uh, Jim Fennison was a driver. J.W. Manus was on there, and there was an auxiliary guy. We had one call while I was there. Well, the auxiliary firemen, we had, I don't think we had that many, but they would come and work on weekends and nights and ride with us and help us out. Typical day, we'd get to work. We'd, we had to be there at 8 o'clock. If you were one second late, you worked five hours the next day. When that bell hit, you'd better be standing in front of your truck in full dress uniform, necktie and cap, coat. And then, as soon as that was, as soon as we uh, dismissed from that, we changed clothes, put on some work clothes, we cleaned the station. We mopped and swept and mopped the floors, the truck floors, all the rooms, cleaned the bathrooms. Uh, and the drivers were responsible for dusting the trucks, and they had to be done every day. And if it had been out on the previous call, 
it had to be washed before it could be used again. And then after that, uh, it was about time to think about the lunch. And uh, after lunch, we always had class. We had, had to learn our streets because we didn't have, we didn't have any, uh, only maps we had were paper maps and they were very few. But we had, on our days off, we would go out and ride our territory to learn streets. But then after class, then it was, we were free to do whatever until supper time. And then, but soon as uh, we got through cleaning up, we had to be back in dress uniform. White shirt, tie. Well, we took turns cooking. We had to, uh, we had to learn to cook. I didn't, I wasn't consider myself a good cook. But I had a guy, when I was at, I was only at uh, station, at Central Station, until September, and I was moved to 10. Got a new tanker put out there, so anyway, I went to 10. And there's a couple of guys out there who are very good cooks. I learned a lot from them, how to cook, and this one guy, he left though, he didn't stay on the department, but he was so good as a cook. But we had to take turns, and we would pay. When I first went on, we would we would have two meals, uh, lunch and supper, for fifty cents a day per person. So my favorite dish, I think my favorite dish was pinto beans, macaroni and cheese, and turnip greens and cornbread. But one one thing, John Loy was a good cook, and he made the best biscuits and the chicken casserole. He was really good with that. First captain was at Station 10 was uh, J.P. Barbie. I learned a lot from him. Uh, he, A lot of people didn't like him, but uh, I learned a lot from him. And I don't think he liked me much when I first went out there, but I thought, well, I've got... I got to be more, I had to get more initiative, I guess. And finally, he, I think he finally learned to like me before he became a battalion chief. Captain Barbie, after he became chief, they could call him Soft Shoe. Well, of course, back then we had this one big room and we all the guys slept in there together. And uh, I remember Larry Bradley was in the bed beside me, and he would talk in his sleep at night. And I'd lay there and listen to him, and I'd think, well, I'm going to remember what he said and tell him the next morning what he said. Well, of course, the next morning I couldn't remember what he had said. <laughs> and another time, uh, he, uh, he always liked to pick on Red Wren. And uh, we found this big, I don't know where he got this big rubber spider. But he hooked it to a string, hooked it up to the ceiling right over Red's bed, and run the string to his bed, which was almost the full length of the room. And by the time Red would, his laying there and about to sleep, he would lower that spider down on him, and he'd slap his face, and he'd jerk that spider up, back up, and Red finally got up, went out to the truck, got a flashlight, and come in and look and see what that was. <laughs> and found that thing, and he got a little hot over there. Uh, uh, the value of eating together, excuse me. Uh, back then, uh, we didn't, some, on Sundays usually people would bring their own, but usually uh, we got to where we would cook one meal on Sunday, and uh, it'd be in a, like a roast. That was our favorite thing to do for Sunday, and then, uh, would have enough left over for supper. But uh, I think it's very important that you sit down and eat together because you can sit there and talk about different things. And, uh, I know at one station we had TV in there and we'd always watch the news or something and together. The first fire, first fire that I can remember was, I was on this, the tanker it was a brand new 58 Ford tanker. Uh, 
at Station 10, and it was just two of us on there. The truck was so new, we had no radio on it. So we had this big field fire. Engine 10 had gone out on another call, and we were there at the station by ourselves, and we got this call. So we took off down to this, it was on uh, Boulevard or one of those streets, big field fire behind this house. And when we got there, I jumped off, got a broom, started beating it out as much as I could, and looked around and I didn't see the driver. He had jumped off the truck, run in the house to call Central Station to tell them that we had arrived and to send us some help <laughs> because we did not have a radio. And that's the time, that's the call, I lost my eyebrows and they never came back. So the only medical call, the only medical call I remember was uh, at Station 10, was the, the guy who ran the service station next door had a heart attack. And the guys run over there and they had this uh, resuscitator. But when they got over there, they didn't know how to use it. <laughs> and of course, he didn't, he didn't make it. And um, the, the, neck, the other oh yeah, one was a, a wreck right in front of the station. Two cars ran head on. Back then, engine, at Engine 10, Station 10, the road was just two lanes with side ditch on each side. But anyways, two cars ran head on together right there at Merritt Drive. And so uh, we went out there to assist that. But that's the only... And occasionally, ambulance, if they got a call, they would stop and pick up a fireman. I remember one of the guys at our station, they came and picked him up going to a wreck one time. Uh, the first call where a life was lost was in uh, out Pomona on, uh, I think it's Watkins Street. I was at Station 10, and we got this call, a house fire. And we got in there, and uh, the, the woman had left her child asleep in the house and had gone just one block away to the store. And she told us that, that the child was in there. And, of course, I didn't go in the building, but one of the a couple of the guys went in and they couldn't find him for the smoke. And what the reason they couldn't find him because a couch had been slid up beside the bed and not realizing that the bed was behind the couch and they couldn't find the child. And of course the child was about about a year old and my son was that same age at that time. And I don't think I slept at all that night. In fact, we had the calls with had two two children, and then the, I think it was either two or three adults. We had fires that lost their lives. The biggest fire was on was, of course, Davy Street. The first big fire I remember being on was uh, when I was at Station Ten. Of course, I was at Station Ten a long time from 58 to 70, when I finally got promoted, we went into three shifts. But uh, we we had to go up and help, uh, well, Engine 8, when George C. Brown, the uh, cedar plant burned, we had to go up there. That was my first big fire. And then when I, I got promoted in 1970, went to Station 9, and while I was at 9, we had a warehouse fire there on, the, I think it's Guilford Avenue, right near where the, uh, Friend Avenue goes over the railroad. We set up on that bridge and uh, pumped down into a deluge gun down on the ground below the bridge. We were there uh, at least three hours probably. When 9-11 happened, uh, I thought about all those firemen and all the that they were going through. Of course, we didn't. I don't. I don't remember experiencing anything that extreme while I was here. But uh, my biggest fire was Davis Street, of course, and we had set up back behind on the 
on that railroad spur that goes into the Daly Nears. And we got there just before that back wall collapsed. But we were there all night and uh, until the next morning. And uh, that's the first time I can remember ever having hamburgers for breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, some of the people that I looked up to, of course, uh, talking about Chief Barbie, he was my cap first captain. I learned a lot from him about how pumps worked and course we learned some of that in training but he he went had been in the Navy and worked as a firefighter in the Navy so I learned a lot from him and then uh, a lot of the other guys that I'd worked with who had been on the time uh, uh, can't remember the name but then I, a couple of captains a couple of captains I worked with uh, Al Stewart and Jack Coble. They were two captains I worked with at Station 10 before I got promoted. In fact, Al was my captain when I got promoted and he he really gave me a lot of tips and uh, told me how to, I should do, how I should be as a captain. And of course, uh, Jack was, uh, he later became uh, assistant chief, and I learned a lot from them. And uh, Red Wren, he was tough, but he he I learned a lot from him. He did never went far as being promoted, but he was a good firefighter. You know, I was telling you things that the way things had changed over the years. Uh, if you remember uh, when we first went on, we had to wear dress uniform all day except when we were cleaning up. And then after, uh, when Chief Powell became chief, then he uh, put us into, uh, had us uh, get, got us some work clothes that we could wear, class B, I guess they call it. And, uh, but, and we, eventually we didn't have to wear the dress uniforms anymore and except for funerals and that sort of stuff and speaking of funerals when we first came on you went to a funeral if chief moon Wyrick said so and so's funeral is such and such day you better show up if you were off work if you were off duty that day because we were only off we worked on one one day on one day off and if you were off that day, you'd better show up for that funeral or be sick. How did we cope with the deaths? Uh, I don't remember other than just trying to stop thinking about it. Or, mm -hmm. or, of course, that's hard to do. You think about the family and how hard it is on them, especially to see somebody, a burned body. But uh, we had no psychologists, anybody come talking with us. Well, the first first firefighter killed in line of duty that I remember was Jesse Gray. Uh, Fred Lawrence was in our training class, and he was a super guy, and, and he was driving the truck that uh, ran over Jesse. And so I remember a couple of us uh, from Station 10, went to uh, Fred's house to see him and several people, several of the firemen there to support him because you know he had to feel really, really bad about being the driver of that truck that caused his death. Uh, then we had several firefighters who took their own lives and that was hard to deal with. I mean, it made you want to wonder why, you know, was it something at work or was it family life or just hard to understand how somebody could do that or why. Female firefighters, yes, I worked with two female firefighters. I had uh, one on, well, I had one on my shift and there's one on the other shift. 
at, when I was at Station 5, on Engine 5. And uh, they were both great firefighters. I mean, <laughs> they could do anything that the other guys could do. I remember one call, seeing this, I won't call any names, but she, uh, she was coming up through that yard pulling this hose, and it was a two, two and a half inch, is that what it was? Dragging his hose up through there, and I thought, who is this guy? And it come, turned out to be the, the girl. She was, she was tough. If I had to do over with, I would be, do the same thing. I loved the fire department. But, you know, there was one time when I was at Station 10, uh, there was a couple of guys who just, I don't know, they just rubbed me the wrong way or something. And I was about ready to quit, but I had nothing else lined up. So thank, thank the Lord I did not quit because uh, that's the greatest job I ever had. I had several jobs before that, but that was the greatest one. Would I change anything? Well, it's been so long since I worked there, and everything has changed so much. I remember visiting the station one day. I'd been retired several years, and I went out to visit one of my old guys. And I couldn't even get up in the cab of the truck for all the computer stuff and sitting in there. Of course, now, back, I remember at four, we had this big old wooden box up in the seat with a bunch of maps. And half the time, those maps weren't up to date. But I think they got it pretty good now. I was not in the military. I was drafted. When I, while I was working at Western Electric, I was drafted. Spent a day down in Charlotte. Uh, but they sent me home because I had a heart murmur. And I was looking forward to going home because I was ready to go on and of course, when I got home, I surprised my wife. We had been married for just a few months. And of course, we, I was glad to be home once I got back. But I was a little disappointed that they didn't keep me. A successful firefighter, I think, well, not being so great a firefighter, I think getting along with all the guys and loving your job, doing the best you can, and being a good neighbor. Uh, I remember a lot of the neighbors at Station 9, they'd come visit, they'd bring us food, and we would, of course, in turn do things for them, little, little help them out sometimes. I never was really frightened on a call because of, I knew that the Lord was taking care of me, although I got in some tight places and for an instant, I guess you would say. I was a little a little frightened, but I knew I would get out okay. My health has been good. I just saw my uh, cardiologist last week, and he was pleased and couldn't believe that I'm 88 years old. Well, what would I like the fire department to remember? I would like to be remembered as a good captain, a fair captain. Uh, the other night when we went out to that supper, it was the first supper I'd been to, I saw one of the guys that I had worked with, and he greeted me by saying, he's the greatest captain I had. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure about that, but that made me feel good. I'd like for my family to, re to remember me as being a part of a almost like a brotherhood. In fact, back Thanksgiving time, the ambulance had to come take me to the hospital and they called the fire department to come help get me to the ambulance. And my son was in the room and he was talking to them and said about being a fireman, it's more like a, being in a brotherhood, everybody taking care of everybody. And then to see uh, see these guys when you're off, and remember all the good times together. 
Well, I know I haven't been a perfect guy in my life, but I've tried to do my best. But I think um, I would like to uh, just say, do the best at your job. Take care of your co-workers. Support them. Uh, not only at the fire station, but out. I remember uh, being in the motorcycle club, how close we were, and then going to funerals, even going to weddings. I remember going to uh, one of my guy's weddings, and that surprised him and his wife. Uh, just being tight-knit, on and off the job. What do I miss most? I, well, I guess it would be the people, being around the people. Uh, that's one reason that uh, I remember when uh, they were had, getting ready to have the uh, battalion chief test. I did not take it, and they, they wondered why. I said, because I don't want to be stuck by myself in a car. I want to be on the truck with the guys. And I can drive a car anytime. I can't be on the fire truck anytime. And being with all these guys. And uh, we had some great times together, some fun times together, some hard times together. And uh, just, just working together. The value of these recordings, I think, is letting uh, these new guys see how uh, life was in the olden days, back when we, uh, I'd been on a uh, department for, let's see, 58, to uh, about 73. We never had portable radios. And we finally got one portable radio per company and the captain had to use it. And uh, and at Station 4, I remember we got a call one night, and we got, to, I always left the walkie on the truck. Got to the house that we were going to, and uh, I reached up to get my walkie, <laughs> and there was no walkie there. That was an empty case. Some kids had come in and stole our walkie-talkie during that day. And, I think they finally found it years later. Well, to wrap it up, I would like to talk about some of the funny things that happened. I can't tell a funny story like uh, Bobby Wooten because I loved Bobby. I loved it when he would come up to Station 5 and ride the car when the chief was off. But uh, I remember uh, at Station 10, one day, when Al Stewart was our captain, and Richard Cates and I were in the kitchen, and we made this little uh, up, made up this little uh, fun thing to do. Uh, we took a pie pan, filled it up with whipped cream, and waited for Al to come in the kitchen, and as soon as he came in the door, we started arguing with each other. Richard Cates and I did. And he grabbed that pie and hit me in the face with it. And Al, he didn't know what to do. He just turned around and went out the door. <laughs> he was not going to get in the middle of that. And uh, But later on, he, he knew what we were doing. But he didn't know. At first, he did not know what to say. <laughs> and another time, um, at Station 10. We did a lot of stuff at Station 10. We'd sort of mellowed out after that. But uh, at Station 10, we had rigged up a radio and run the, playing music through our station speakers. And and when uh, we see the, we'd see the chief coming, we would turn that radio off because uh, Chief Barbie had been promoted to battalion chief. And if we saw his car coming, we'd turn that radio off because we knew what would happen if he heard that music. Well, this one day he slipped in. The music was playing. And Jerry Wheeler saw the chief and says, Listen, chief, ain't this the greatest thing? It's music in the station, all over the station. Well, 
that didn't last. <laughs> that radio went. And another time, um, some of the guys took some quick hitch uh, turnout gear, we called it quick hitch back then, and stuffed it, made it look like a, a person, and hung it up back in the hose room. And when the garbage men came, they came around to the back and get our garbage can, and they told them, says, can you come in here and get this stuff out of this room? They said, oh, yeah. So when they opened the door, there was a big old giant body standing there with a helmet and coat and everything. And they they jumped back. It took them a while to realize what it was. And several things like that. I'd like to say, uh, it's when I was got promoted in 1970 and went to Station 9, uh, I had some good guys out there. I remember one time I was going up on the roof right outside of my uh, our bedroom and I had this extension ladder and I had it and I went up on the roof and I came back down and I uh, was going to let the ladder down so I just let it, let it slide on down by itself and when it come off the roof it crashed right into the window. Glass went all over the bed in there. And Big John Michael, oh, they all heard the crash, but Big John, he came, and he says, we'll fix this. So he got all the glass up, and we had stored some windows up on the roof when they put in the window air conditions, because we didn't have air, con air conditioning for a long time. And they had that window down, replaced that window, and John even painted it so it didn't look old before anybody even knew it. So they they really took care of me out there. That was another camaraderie, I guess you'd call it. At Station 10, uh, the truck had been pulled out so we could mop the floors, and it's out front. And, uh, while it was out, Chief, um, I forget which one it was, but anyway, he pulled his car right up in front of the truck. And somebody, that I think uh, Chief Barbie said, would you go out and back the truck in? So I don't know if you ever drove oh, those old, uh, what were they, 48s or 50 models? Right. And finding the reverse gear, wasn't the easiest thing in the world. And I thought I had it in gear, and I'd let the clutch out, and it went forward, and I stopped, and I changed gears, and thought I had it in reverse again. I hit, hit that chief's car and just pushed almost down to the street. I finally got in reverse, got the truck back in the station, and run down. Luckily, the keys was in the chief's car, and pulled it up to the door. And I don't think it hurt it much. If it did, they never mentioned it. So yeah, I never told anybody that, so. <laughs> In closing, the Greensboro Firefighters History Book Committee hopes you have gained a greater insight into the dangers, the challenges, and emotional events that have influenced and shaped the American firefighters.